It is great to, uh, to see everyone this morning. And uh, before we, thanks, bro. Before we read, uh, let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. I, prayer's always good. Father, we love you. Thank you for this morning. We're so grateful that uh, we have opportunities like this to be able to come together as brothers and sisters, as friends, as family, uh, to be able to worship you and to be able to lift up our voices in song to you. It's so good, Father, for us to come and hear and listen to Scripture being read. And it's great for us to check our hearts and to remember all the blessings that you have given us. I pray this morning as, uh, as I speak that you will uh, give me the words to say and help me, Father, to, uh, to communicate in a way that, um, that you want me to communicate. We love you. We thank you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you have learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love the confidence that Paul has in writing these words to his young protege. I love it. I love that he is able to pen to paper, write down these things about himself. And when we read it, I don't think any of us in here as we hear it, I don't think we go, oh my gosh, Paul is so arrogant. Did anybody think that when you were reading it? Anybody bold enough to admit it if you did? No, because we hear him, we hear him say these things about himself, and we're like, well, that's, yeah, because that's who Paul is. He's, he's essentially talking himself up here to Timothy. He says, You know all the good examples in my life. My teaching, good. My way of life, good. My purpose, good. My faith, good. My patience, good. My love, good. My endurance, good. And my sufferings, good. And look what God has done in my life. And he has rescued me. And he has blessed me. Timothy, look at my life. How can Paul get away with saying such things about himself without sounding so boastful or arrogant? If I stood up here and I said to the church, Church, man, look at my life. It's good. Look at my evangelism. It's good. I'm pretty awesome at it. Hey, church, my Bible study, every morning I get up and I read my Bible and I pray and it's good. My kids, I got good kids. Hey, my wife, she's pretty awesome. We have a good marriage. 
Everything's good. I'm good. You probably go, oh my gosh. What an arrogant dude. Now you say, no, I wouldn't do that. But I, I, I. Paul could get up there and say the things that he could say because they were true. And when we understand and we believe and we see the life of someone who is able to get up and say, I am a good disciple. I'm good. And we know their life and we see their life, we would say what? Yeah. But if somebody got up and their life didn't show it, and if they said, I'm a good disciple, we would go, hmm, I don't know about that. Maybe. Paul does say, he says, you know, you know, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You know, you know t- take a look at my example. But he said, but there are in the church imposters. Those who deceive others in the church and, and who are deceived themselves because they don't know the truth. Not really. And we'll come back to the imposter a little later. In Paul's seemingly prideful claim about himself, he stands confidently on the fruit of his life. Because his life is out there for all to see. He says, you know all about my life. (coughs) Paul then goes on to tell Timothy, now continue in what you have learned and, and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you have learned it. He says, whatever you have learned, all the good things that you have learned as a young disciple, as a young disciple, continue in those things. Well, where did Timothy learn it? Paul? We also know that he learned it from his mother and grandmother. But he but so much of who Paul was becoming and growing into was attributed to the one whom he was learning from and following, and that was Paul. And the great things that Timothy learned from Paul were were Bible teaching and a way of life and purpose and faith and patience and love and endurance and suffering, all the things that, that Paul was reminding him of about himself. Paul tells Timothy, if you stick to this like I have, you're going to be just fine. God will rescue you. And what happens, however, if Timothy doesn't heed Paul's charge to him? Well, he'd probably become lukewarm or something else. Turn over in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. What I hope to accomplish this morning in my lesson is to get you today and and maybe even this next week to take some time to reassess your discipleship. Is to reassess, to consider, to go back and, and explore where you are in your walk with God, really. And if you haven't yet made Jesus Lord of your life, I hope that this lesson will trigger a curiosity within you to seek out how you can do that. Paul tells Timothy, this is who I am. This is who you have become. Don't stray from it. Continue in it. When many of us learned what it meant to be a follower of Jesus and to do that with all of our heart, we genuinely committed to it. And we had every intention, right, to do this for the rest of our lives. But over time, some have drifted from the convictions that you had at first. Have time and circumstances chipped away at your convictions? So let's go back and and recap. We're going to do a quick little Bible study, all right? Most of these passages we're about to read, we're going to do it, you know, pretty quickly. 
but I think maybe you might have heard these before. Mark chapter 1. Beginning in verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. When Jesus was calling his first disciples, those who would follow him, he says, when you follow me, one of the things I am calling you to as a follower is to be a fisher of man. Is to be somebody who goes out and brings others to God, who brings others to me. This is a follower. This is a disciple of Jesus. And what do we see these guys do immediately? They obeyed. So another characteristic of a disciple is one who obeys Jesus. Turn over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. I love, you know I love to hear the rustling of paper. Luke 9, verse 23 says, Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus here again describing what it will cost to follow him and he says that if you want to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross daily that you have to be willing to lose your life in order to save it in the end. So a disciple surrenders his life to Jesus and says, I belong to you. Luke verse, uh, chapter 14. Beginning in verse 25. At the top of this uh, paragraph here, it says the cost of being a disciple. There's a cost. And we, many of us, grew up, you know, hearing that there is no cost. That, that, it, that, it's, that it's, there it is for you, for nothing. Just believe in Jesus, and yet there is a cost. In verse 25, it says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And you have to understand, this was a big deal. For Jesus to say this to the people was huge. That he said, if you were to follow me, if you're going to follow me, you have to hate your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own life. And if you don't, you can't follow me. You can't be a disciple. This was huge because family was so important. Now, I know it's important today, but man, there were ties in family life back in those days. This was a monstrous calling. You have to love less or consider your family less than me. That was big. Verse 28, it says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays a foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. You know, you have to, as a, as a disciple, as a Christian, when you make that decision to make Jesus Lord, 
You have to count the cost. Do I have what it takes to do this for the rest of my life? This is not a temporary thing. And then verse 31, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace in the same way. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to give up everything. There is nothing you can hold on to. Nothing. Two kings are going to war, one with 10,000, one with 20,000. The one with 20,000 will defeat the one with 10,000. You are the kings with 10,000. Jesus is the king with 20. We cannot beat him. So he says, in making the terms of peace, you must give up and surrender everything. So if we are to be Jesus' disciples, there's nothing we can hold on to. John chapter 8. Beginning in verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He says, if, if you do not hold to the scriptures, if you do not hold to the teachings of the Bible, this beautiful and awesome book, this amazing, awesome piece of literature, he says, if you don't hold to my teachings, you can't be my disciple. You can't. And the only way that you will ever know the truth about discipleship is through holding to the scriptures. And then Matthew chapter 28. Beginning in verse 18. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says that disciples make other disciples. That's, our, that's the charge and the purpose that we have been given. What Jesus was calling his disciples to, his followers to, was dangerous. And they knew it was dangerous. But if they were to follow him, this was the expectation and there was no exception. So there are three types of people that I want to talk about who exist in the church both 2,000 years ago as well as today. Number one, I want to talk about dangerous disciples. Number two, I want to talk about dangerous imposters. And number three, I want to talk about dangerous lukewarmers. And I want to work backwards on that. So what I want to start with is the dangerous lukewarmers. And, uh, and so turn over in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. So I gave us a little reminder of some of the scriptures that many of us took a look at as, as far as what Jesus calls us to be as disciples, as followers, um, and what that looks like. And, uh, and so again, the challenge is for you to reassess where you are in that. But I also want you to consider these, these three types that we can find within the church. And you need to ask yourself the question, is, is, are one of these me? So number one, dangerous lukewarmers. Revelation 3, verse 14. Uh, Jesus is, is talking to some of the different churches 
out there that have been established, churches that are uh, built and filled with Christians. And, uh, and he says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold as a Christian, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. That's scary. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Jesus tells the church there in Laodicea that there, many of them are lukewarm that you're not hot for God and you're not cold, you're right in the middle. You're just kind of blah. You know, I, the other day, um, I got breakfast with Chloe and she and I had, uh, had our coffees. We ordered our coffee and, and Chloe said, I'll have an iced coffee. And I was like, Ew. Because we just walked in from outside. It was like 40 degrees out. And uh, so it was chilly, so she gets a cold iced coffee, and I said, I want hot coffee. So brought my hot coffee, love my hot coffee. Chloe loves her cold coffee. We were very, both of us, very firm and emphatic about hot and cold. Neither of us care anything about lukewarm coffee because it is nasty And you know what I'm talking about. And it's scary if you enjoy lukewarm coffee. (laughs) Because lukewarm is not good. At one time, the church there had deep conviction, radical, dangerous. But Jesus now says you're lukewarm. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, which is exactly what I would do if I had lukewarm coffee in my mouth. I would spit it out. I wouldn't swallow it. I wanted to begin with dangerous lukewarmers because I believe that this is one that threatens the church the most. Members of the church who have lost their passion, have lost their vision for their lives as dangerous disciples. These are the men and women who at one time were ready to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. Do you remember when you came to the church and you studied the Bible and you got into the baptistry and you said Jesus was Lord? Do you remember what you found? Do you, do you remember what it was that you were like, yes, this is it. I would never have gotten into Lake Herrick, which was nasty, nasty lake in Athens, Georgia, to get baptized in that lake if I hadn't felt that I had found the greatest treasure ever. I found the kingdom of God. I found brothers and sisters who loved each other and fought for each other and held each other accountable and prayed with each other and opened up the word with each other who went out two by two, three by three, four by four, to share their faith and reach out to a lost community together, that they set up times to do that. They got up at 6 a.m. Man, that brother that reached out to me and brought me to church for the first time, he was like, hey, we're going to have prayer at 6 a.m. You want to go? I said, no, thank you. He said, well, you're going anyway. 
I said, well, I'll see if I can get up. He said, I'm going to spend the night at your house, at your apartment then. <laughs> and he got me up, and you know what? I got up at 6 a.m., and I went and prayed with the brothers and sisters. It was, I found treasure. Do you remember what you found? I found salvation. I found and learned about a God who was going to forgive me of my junk. The nasty that I had committed for most of my life. That he was going to let that go and say, I forgive you. Do you remember? The dangerous lukewarm are men and women who repented of the sins they had at one time, consumed them, and were radical in making sure that they didn't come back, but who over time and through circumstances in their lives began to compromise their convictions. And they stopped being radical and allowed life and circumstances to dull their passion for Jesus and the kingdom. These are the Christians who have become comfortable and complacent. I believe they're the most dangerous because when you are a dangerous lukewarmer, you don't realize where you are. You became a Christian, but now you're religious. And you think it's okay. But Jesus says it's not okay. In verse 17, he says, You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Do you, can you imagine if you came to my office and we sat down across from each other and I looked you in the eye and you're not doing great spiritually, okay? Just hypothetically, right? Because I know everyone in this room is doing well spiritually. But hypothetically, you're not. And I look you in the eye and I say, you know what? You are, you are uh, wretched. You are pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. What would you do? You're the most spiritual person in this room. <laughs> Colette, who said that? Amen, she said. Amen. Most probably wouldn't. Probably look at me stunned like, who are you to do me? Who are you? You know? Lukewarmness jeopardizes your ability to remain in the kingdom of God, but we have to realize that that might be where we are. I don't want my status with God and the church to be jeopardized. Verse 16, because you are lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Why would God spit you out? Why would he do that? Because your influence hurts the faith of others. Lukewarmness breeds lukewarmness. When you are lukewarm, especially if you are a long-term uh, member of the church, newer, younger folks come in and they see lukewarm, and they themselves, who are not quite yet fully rooted in the word and in their convictions, may think lukewarm is okay. Dangerous lukewarmers hurt the body of Christ. They tend to think only of themselves. They don't value wise and instructive guidance from older, more mature Christians. They tend to think, well, if it's not sin, then I'll do what I want. They tend to think they have it all together. I am rich and do not need a thing. They don't think they need anything from anyone. Lukewarmers don't realize that they are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, and they don't realize that they are a hot mess and do need help. 
think everything is okay even when others tell you that you're falling short. I read this out of the Enduring Word commentary. I thought it was very powerful. It says, Cold or hot also points to another aspect of lukewarmness. As a picture of uselessness, hot water heals, cold water refreshes, but lukewarm water is useless for either purpose. It was as if Jesus said, if you were hot or cold, I could do something with you. But because you are neither, I will do nothing. The lukewarm Christian has enough of Jesus to satisfy a craving for religion, but not enough for eternal life. The thief on the cross was cold towards Jesus and clearly saw his need. John was hot towards Jesus and enjoyed a relationship of love, but Judas was lukewarm, following Jesus enough to be considered a disciple, yet not giving his heart over to Jesus in fullness. Lukewarm is a dangerous place to be. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous for your brothers and sisters. And it's dangerous for the church. But you can get hot again. You can. Jesus reassures us of that. In verse 18 he says, look, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Jesus says, look, look to my riches. Look to that. Not the world's, not your own, and I will enable you to become once again what you had become at first. I can do that. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus tells those who are lukewarm that it's not too late for you. You can get hot again. I love you. You are my friend. Listen to me. Repent. Turn, and I will take care of you. Well, Jared, how do I know if I'm a dangerous lukewarmer? How do I know that? Because you already established that a lukewarm person can be deceived. Well, I don't know. I think you have to, you have to do some soul searching you need to look at your life and you need to compare it to what Jesus calls you to. But I also think you need to think about a few things. Like when's the last time? When's the last time that you were excited about spending time with God? When you woke up and you were like, I can't wait to get into the Word. I can't wait to hear what God has to say to me today. I can't wait to pray and share with God what is on my heart. When's the last time you wanted to share your quiet time or what you're learning in the Bible with someone else? This was so awesome. What I learned today in this passage blows my mind and I want to share it with you. When's the last time? When's the last time that your heart raced a little bit or a lot because you found someone that you knew you were going to share your faith with? That you were in the line at the Walmart and your heart started racing because you had already gotten it in your head that I'm going to invite this person to church. I'm going to invite them to my community group. I'm going to invite them to a Bible study. And your heart raced because you were nervous because you didn't know what they were going to say or how they were going to respond. When's the last time? When's the last time your heart burned because you had sinned and you couldn't wait to get it off your chest. You couldn't wait to tell a brother or sister that you blew it because you didn't want that on your conscience, because you didn't want that hovering over you, 
and because you know that that sin nailed Jesus to the cross. When's the last time? Those are a few things. Those are a few things that maybe you can think about. Am I lukewarm? The second type of person I want to talk about is the dangerous imposters. Turn over in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, um, I'm only, I'm only going to hit on this one just for a minute. I'm going to try to keep this one pretty short, mainly because I don't, I don't believe we have many dangerous imposters here at Campus View, although I'd be naive to think that we, we, we don't have any. Um, so I do think that we need to address it. What's an imposter? It's a person who deceives others by pretending to be someone or something they're not. I even looked up synonyms for imposter. Charlatan, fake, faker, fraud, hoaxer, humbug, mountebank, phony, pretender, quack, quacksalver, sham. I don't even know what some of those words mean other than they mean imposter. Now, I don't believe that those who are in sin are imposters. I don't believe that. I do, however, believe that those who choose to remain in sin and live a double life are. I don't believe that those who struggle but who are always fighting and working with God and with others in the church to overcome are imposters. But I do, however, believe that those who do not fight and who are fine in remaining in their sin and yet come to church as though nothing is wrong are Going back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he, Jesus says, or Paul says, he says, look, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he says, they will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, a dangerous imposter is someone who says they follow Jesus, but they don't. They're not following Jesus. They, they say it passionately, and without hesitation, but they're not following Jesus. They say they love their brother and sister in the church, but they don't. A dangerous imposter deceives. They act one way around the body or at church on Sundays, at church on Wednesdays at devotionals, community groups, but when they are alone or out with their friends in the world, they act a completely different way. It's an imposter. Or even when they're around weaker Christians or disciples because they know that that brother or sister probably isn't going to out them in any way. And so the imposter hurts even brothers and sisters within the church in that way. A dangerous imposter is aware of their deceit. They purposely hide their sin and are less concerned about who they hurt as long as they can get or achieve what they want. But here's the thing. In time, God always brings the dangerous imposter to light. He always does. Always. Sooner or later, they get caught. You know, Stacy uh, is a big dateline and 48 Hours Investigates um, Watcher. She loves those shows, those news shows, and she kind of drags me into that, um, you know, into those shows. And we're watching, and, and it's amazing. You watch some of these stories of these people who, who think about and kind of conspire to murder someone. And they go through this whole thing and then they get caught and they go on trial and then they go to prison. But Stacy and I always look and say, how do they think they can get away with this? What are these people thinking? How can you, how can you think you can get away with that? It's mind-blowing. If you ever watch these shows, it's crazy. They think they're so smart. It's the same way in the church. How do we think we can get away with it? But the imposter is not only one who deceives, but they themselves are deceived. They truly believe that they can. First Timothy chapter five, you can just write it down, verse 24. 
1 Timothy 5, 24 says, the sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. He says, look, it's going to happen. It's whatever it is, God will reveal it. And when he does, it's bad. Luke 12, verse 2 says, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roof. Yes, there are dangerous imposters in the church, but they will always get caught. I hope and pray that that's not who you are. But if it is, I want you to reassess your life. Reassess who you want to be. And then finally, I want to talk about the third type of person in the church, and that's dangerous disciple. Turn over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. I read this blog out of a, uh, a website called discipleship.org. I thought, it was, uh, I thought it was pretty good, so I'm going to read it to you guys as you're turning to Acts chapter 11. It says, I don't know about you, but I want to be a dangerous disciple. I want to be the kind of disciple that Satan hates to see coming. The kind of disciple that the demons are, are trying to figure out how to slow down. I want to become the kind of disciple that is causing a ruckus in hell. I want to live every day in such a way that the life God has given me is being used to the fullest for his glory. Now, I'm not there yet, but I want to get to the point to where God is using me every moment to, to impact eternity. As I understand the scriptures of the life of Christ, the most dangerous disciple on the planet is the one who is multiplying more disciples. Growing God's kingdom is the one thing that Satan fears most. It is the one thing that, that has the power to put a dent in the darkness and push back the evil influence in the world today. Men and women who live in such a way that they are multiplying many generations of men and women who will follow Jesus. Those are dangerous disciples. It's building up the kingdom of God. What does it take to become dangerous? Determination. The most important thing that defines a dangerous disciple is dogged de determination. In other words, someone who truly believes in the calling that we have received. With a spirit that simply will not give up. An attitude that will not let you quit. Someone who puts their hand to the plow and just keeps on going. Even when others have quit and gone home. Satan's, numbers, uh, Satan's number one most effective strategy against growth is distraction. His most effective tool against multiplying disciples is to get us distracted, turning us into lukewarm Christians with good things that keep us from the best things. And if Satan can cause a disciple to, to get busy with the wrong things, he can stop them from being productive and the right things. As disciples, it is so essential that we stay focused on what really matters. I thought that was a great blog. And as I was reading it, I could, I could hear it as I was trying to read it, just passionate and fired up and, you know, just full of zeal. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul told Timothy, It is going to be dangerous for you to be a disciple. It should be dangerous. I can remember at the age of 21 when it all changed for me. I grew up a nominal Christian. That is a Christian by name only. Not by action, not by life, just by belief. Yes, I believed in God. Yes, I believed in Jesus. But no, I was not living the life of a Christian, follower of Jesus, disciple. I was a nominal Christian. Maybe that's who you are today, a nominal Christian. 
You are not a fisher of man. You are not obedient to God. You don't really deny yourself or take up your cross daily. Jesus is not really Lord of your life. You only sort of hold to the teachings of Jesus. You have not really counted the cost of following him. You haven't really given up everything you have in your heart to follow him. This is who I was. Good intentioned, but by name only, Christian. But like I said, I remember when it changed. I remember when the guys sat down with me and opened up the scriptures and looked at all those passages that we looked at at the beginning of this lesson. And I remember being shocked and the light bulb going off for the first time. And they asked me, Jared, are you a disciple of Jesus? And I said, no, just like that, because I knew. And then they asked the tougher question, are you a Christian? Wait a minute. A disciple and a Christian. I'm not a Christian. Am I a disciple? Acts chapter 11, verse 19 says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done and was glad and encouraged. And 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 was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their heart. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Jared, are you a disciple? No! Are you a Christian? How can I be a Christian if I'm not a disciple? They are one and the same. You cannot be a Christian if you are not following Jesus. You know, the problem we face, the culture we live in today, we avoid dangerous and we long for safe. There is a time for us to seek safety in the arms of Jesus. There's a time when when we need rest as the Lamberts so beautifully reminded us of. Being a Christian, though, was never about safe. Christianity is about risk. It's about challenge. It's about danger. I do think that in our dangerous relationships, we should have a safe relationship to go to. Brothers and sisters that we have greater trust built with whom we can share and be open with and know that it's not going to be spread everywhere through gossip and slander. We need that safe place. But Christianity is a risk in every way. So I remember when that light bulb went off. Jared, are you a Christian? No, I was not. And then, Jared, do you want to be? Yeah, yeah, I want to be a Christian. In that moment, I reassessed my life. Who I was, where I was, what I was doing, how I was doing it. And in that reassessment, I made a decision that Jesus was going to be Lord of my life before it was done. 
I was challenged to come to everything that the church was doing from Sunday to Wednesday to Bible talk to, you know, family group meetings to 6 a.m. prayer times, all that for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, if I didn't see the kingdom of God, go find it because Jesus, God says it will endure forever. And I stuck around and on that 14th day, I was baptized. And it changed my life forever. I am calling us to have a discipleship reassessment. Are you a dangerous lukewarmer? Are you a dangerous imposter? Are you a dangerous disciple? Brothers and sisters, we need each other to give our discipleship all we got. 100%. Everything we can muster. Everything that we can give. We need to make it a dangerous discipleship. The church needs it. Our family needs it. Our children need it. The community needs it. Dangerous discipleship. Amen.